everybody, welcome to another uh, Notorious interview and uh, hopefully this new technology system I'm trying to use will be okay. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I have with me the wonderful Sam DeBoard, the CEO of Riso, and I love your backdrop there, you know, representing the brand. <laughs> Without a doubt, good to be here, Rob. Nice yeah. to see you as close as we've been able to see each other in a while. I know. And you know, one of the things behind upgrading this platform is like, I feel like this is high def 1080, so I could see you like real well. But then again, it might be your camera set up. I mean, you know. No, I think your platform is definitely better than the average Zoom call. So it yeah. looks uh, <laughs> looking pretty posh over there right now. I don't know, man. You know, I, I was thinking like, have you invested in your whole video, home video setup? You know what I mean? Like because be Zoom is so much. Yeah. You look like you have. I mean, you've got some serious audio equipment there. No? Well, I've had this for forever, right? Just because I've been doing sort of podcasting. But yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about going like the full on like DSLR route. You know what I mean? Like Austin yeah, Allison has a setup that's one. awesome, you know? Yeah, I mean, there. I, I think a lot of us just want the Zoom to just work for all these meetings all day. But I for know. this more, you know, recorded kind of content, yeah. we're seeing people with some pretty nice setups and. Um, takes away some of the wrinkles and the gray, I guess. Yeah, or or adds them back on because of you know, 4K just makes all of the flaws pop. You know, <laughs> right, right. Could go either direction. So, hey, thanks for joining me. Um, there's a lot going on, but I thought you know, before we lose sight of it, you wrote a five parter for Realtor Magazine, I think, that I thought was one of the best sort of series. You know, uh, and you know, our relationship being such that we don't necessarily go to everything, but and we argue and debate, but that's that's part of the fun, it's you fun. know? It is. Uh, so I just thought I'd like kind of get your take on it. Uh, it is something that, unfortunately, I feel like is is getting a bit lost because of all this big news happening in the industry and so on, but it's just really good stuff, you know? So first of all, Thank maybe, you. you know, for people who haven't read it, I think my first recommendation is you should go on Realtor Magazine and look for the Marketplace MLS Mandate article. That's the first one that you wrote, and it's a five-parter. Right. So right. we're going to talk about it. And obviously, I'm going to encourage everyone that's listening to go read the whole thing, uh, especially if you're in the MLS space. But Sam, why'd you write this? Like, what what prompted you to do this five parter? Well, I don't think anybody sets out to write a five part series. Um, you know, I don't I don't know if uh, you you write a lot. You write yeah. more than the average person. Um, and I write a lot more. Um, but you know, you go throughout the year, stories pop up, you see things about companies, you know, people, um, business processes that you care about. Um, but a lot of times I just drop it in a Google doc, something happened, you got an idea, you know, how it relates to something else. Um, and I used to write almost every morning when I was a broker for some right. blog or outlet over time, my mornings have gotten a little bit more busy at Riso over the last couple of years. So I, I haven't been able to turn out as much content. But it just became this collection of stories that eventually all clearly fed into the same storyline about the MLS space. Um, and you know, we've talked a lot about the MLS space. Um, I've been called a Boy Scout about MLS. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way some people feel about the Constitution, democracy, almost a religious sort of um, <laughs> love for this kind of thing. Um, I think most people look at the MLS as a business tool. And, and really don't capture the, the marketplace benefits and the consumer benefits that really don't exist through most mm -hmm. of the world that mm -hmm. we have here. So um, it's, a, it's a constant thing for me to try to remind people how good they have it um, and, and to not take that for granted, but continually keep moving it forward to be pro-consumer, pro-competitive. Okay. All right. So let's dive into the parts a little bit, because part one, you're talking about participant access to listings, showings and data. Like what? What did you see as the problem? And you know, what were you sort of hoping MLSs or realtors would do about that? So I think all of these are just commentary on current trends. Um, you've got business people in the marketplace who are going to be creative. They're going to try new things. We know this: real estate agents and brokers are some of the most creative people out there mm -hmm. um, because most are independent contractors, independent brokerages. Um, they're working with individual consumers, so all their needs are slightly different. Um, and sometimes they might lose sight of the foundation that they have. So um, ways that you might talk to a seller and say, hey, I can do your listing 85 different ways. Maybe five of those are actually not beneficial to the marketplace that you're a part of in the MLS. 
um, you already benefit from the fact that all the other brokers who are licensed and have duties to consumers, duties of honesty to each other, and agree to cooperate in the MLS, um, and they share listings. That's the basics of it. Okay. Um, we share listings. That's why we're an MLS. And there are a lot of practices popping up where um, you know folks are what appears to be trying to silo listings to try sure. to break them up, um, try to use different processes within the MLS to make them more difficult to access by their broker participants in the MLS and then potentially consumers downstream. Um, and those all need to be seen in the light of how do you ensure that value of the MLS is still there and not just work on individual business practices with that sort of oversight. Okay. Um, so obviously we're talking about coming soon. We're talking about clear cooperation. One of many things. Right. Um, yeah, coming soon, pocket listings, obscuring of addresses, um, anything that makes it more difficult for licensed brokers to share and show and sell listings to consumers. Right. So, you know, that um, Inman panel, right, where uh, what's her name? Courtney Polos, I right. think is her name, you know, basically yeah. beat up on Danae, uh, you know, <laughs> our friend Danae, although she did right. hold her own. I, I thought Danae, you know, actually did right. a pretty decent job. Um, yeah. There is one thing, and again, you and I have talked about this. I think you commented on it. I, when this whole clear cooperation was proposed, I was like, this office exclusive exclusion is, is a loophole that swallows the rule. Uh, and I think you were saying, well, let's you know, see how it goes. Now that we've kind of seen how it goes, like, have you changed your mind on that? Do we need to do something about that? I think your point is similar to Courtney's, which was um, a lot of people, I, I think you understand the rule well. Yeah. I think Courtney and other folks who have talked about coming soon um, and its relationship to office exclusives have not necessarily fully um, gone through the history of this. So, I mean, office exclusive has been a concept in MLS forever. Mm -hmm. It's been something that folks have done far before clear cooperation. So right. um, as MLS has started developing coming soons, you obviously added complexity to the situation. Um, you know, we've got, you, you've done an interview with, you know, Jack Ryan from Rex, who said yep. similar things to Courtney that agents thought they couldn't do coming soon because of NAR. There's no rule at NAR that you can't do coming soon. Um, you're allowed to do that. And many MLSs do employ that. Clear cooperation works with coming soon. Um, you can list these properties and share them with the other brokers. The office exclusive, which has been in existence, which the brokerage community said they wanted to keep, um, was, was left in place. So now your question that, that you're getting to is, um, do large brokerages have advantages over smaller brokerages because they can do an office exclusive? And the answer is yes, they always have. And yes, they continue to. Large organizations have always had scale advantages over smaller organizations. So if the community were to come back and say, um, we don't want office exclusives anymore either, that's an interesting conversation to have for mm -hmm. the industry. But um, there's a lot of, I'll just call them shallow arguments out there that clear cooperation has somehow created this new benefit for brokerages. Now it's, it's different, it's certainly different now. Um, but it's not specifically written to benefit a large brokerage. And if you'd sit through those meetings, um, the kind of folks who consider this policy, um, you've got brokerage and MLS execs who ask every single one of these questions that, um, that are asked about in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Does it benefit big brokerages, small brokerages? Should it just be an individual office? Should it be a corporate entity? Should it be a brokerage or a licensed entity? Mm -hmm. You have to pick. You've got to choose a line. You've got to choose a definition. Um, is it a franchiser? You're always going to have somebody who's unhappy with the sausage making. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important for people to know that all of these questions were answered. We've had um, some inquiries from folks in the industry who would get in front of these kinds of committees and um, assume that these folks are not pra practitioners who are making the decisions, who don't know how the system works, um, that it's just some realtor folks off in some committee land on staff making decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. You've got some of the smartest people in the industry who, who walk through all these questions and make the best decision for um, the realtor membership as a whole, which is the brokerage agent MLS community by and large. Uh, okay, that, that was a wonderful, uh, you know, towing the party line answer there. 
So I'm going to try and get you back to, I'm asking what you think. Now that we've seen this in place, is the position that large brokerages have always had this advantage? So under clear cooperation, they should continue to have this advantage. Or do you, you know, or have your, has, has, you know, Courtney Polo situation, and she's not alone, right? A lot of the smaller boutique brokers are realizing, oh, wow, okay, under this, the big brokers really do have this huge advantage. Because the one difference is under the coming, before clear cooperation, you know, smaller brokers, individual agents could go and do a coming soon and leverage technology. I mean, we're talking about Zillow, right? They could put stuff on Zillow, say, hey, here's something that's coming soon. Now they can't. Well, they can. How? So MLSs have coming soon statuses okay. where the property is advertised to the public. Um, and so I think that's important to, and it may sound like company line, but let's let's put the details out there for folks. You can list privately if you need privacy. You can list FISBO. Okay. You can list with a broker who is not an M a member of the MLS if you want to have a listing and advertise it, but not have it in the MLS. Right. You can list in the MLS as an office exclusive if you want privacy. You can list in the MLS with restricted showings to people who are pre-screened by your listing agent. So first and foremost, coming soon has been said by a lot of folks to be pre-marketing, prepping a property. And a different question of office exclusive is a privacy sort of a feature that, that these folks want privacy. So the question we need to ask is, what does that consumer need? Okay. Coming soon to build pre-marketing in the MLS and can be advertised on Zillow, et cetera, as long as it's in the MLS and shared with brokers. Or does that consumer need privacy? In which case it's the broker's responsibility to provide that privacy. And the big question, which is what we really need to get to is, right. are the brokers using Office exclusive for the privacy of the client? And the, as the client asking for that, or is this a marketing technique? Um, and you can talk about whatever business reasons an organization might do that. I think that's the question people are asking is if Office Exclusive you, immediately oh, became right. more highly leveraged, is that in the best interest of the consumer? It, it probably isn't, but it's in the best interest of the broker, right? Which is not what they're licensed to do. Uh, Brokers I, and agents are licensed to work in the best interest of their client. Understood, but you do understand like, this does happen, right? I mean, oh, these sure. are still business people pursuing their self-interest. It, it doesn't mean we excuse it, though. So then the question becomes, what do we do? So I guess another way to think about it is, you're still on the committee, right? You're still on the MLS yes. Emerging Tech Committee, and you're a major right. leader in the industry, right? So what I, would you need to see for you to say, you know, we need to get rid of this loophole? Uh, you know, I don't think I would make a proposal like that, Rob, uh, as as we I think we've outlined the concept. And I think that's where you'd want to get the community feedback, as you know, we've talked about before. Um, you know, I'm obviously a, a representative RESO and NAR mm -hmm. in certain capacities today. These are just my opinions. What, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I see in the industry there. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of folks out there saying office exclusives are being used as a marketing tactic for consumers that don't need privacy. And we should investigate that because we're saying these things. We need statistics. We need to actually look into right, that. Right, see, is right. it really a problem or is it a pain point for agents who are writing 15 offers for every client and not getting closings? And this is one of many pain points. I'm not sure. I, I don't think we have good stats on that. So that would be the first thing to do is um, agents are rightfully in pain in some of these inventory constricted markets. And when they see these office exclusive sell, um, they may rightly or wrongly, you know, see that that was probably someone who was um, office exclusive for the benefit of the broker and not the consumer. But but we don't have stats. At least I haven't seen reporting on. Right, that. right. So yeah. what I'm saying is, what stats would you would you need to see for you to say, you know, what? Again, your personal opinion. It doesn't sure. mean this will be the decision, right? But it's helping you know me and helping hopefully listen understand like how smart, intelligent people think about this. Like, what would you need to see for you to go? You know what? Uh, it's time to get rid of this. It's like 50%, like 25%, like what's, what's the stat you well, need you, to see? You know, you won't get a number like that for me or to say, you know, get rid of it based on that. But I think it would be really interesting for the, industry. are there certain portions of the brokerage community that did not use office exclusives prior to clear cooperation and now ramp those up? 
and then to be able to ask the brokerages, what's what's the reason for this? Is this um, and, and maybe they've got a good reason. Maybe it's not these assumptions that everyone's making about for the profit of the brokerage organization. But those questions are being asked mm -hmm. um, and, and these would be interesting things to report on. OK. Um, let's continue to move on. So part two, you talk about participant access to equity for new business models. Tell me what that was about. Like, what were you thinking with that? Um, I mean, I, we all know the big names in the industry that are getting discussed. So I'll just throw these out right now as we're talking about right. Zillow and Showing Time, CoreLogic, Redfin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are all resale members. Open door, right? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, so um, you know, from, from our perspective, these are, are businesses, if they're following the law, if they are doing what they're supposed to be doing for consumers, um, they're realtor members in many cases, they're MLS right. participants. Um, they, there's certainly competitive issues out there for the companies that they work with. And, um, those are competitive issues. It's business. Right. Um, but it, it sort of bleeds into conversations sometimes at a, at a board or an association or MLS level that might think of things in a more traditional sense. You know, these brokers that we know, and we've known for years do business this way, whereas these ones coming in are not doing business the way that we traditionally saw. Right. Um, and, and maybe that makes us feel like they're not traditional participants, but um, to really ensure, you know, first of all, that you are building a growing and expanding broker cooperative, as opposed to forcing new business models out. Um, these organizations should be looking to, to open that tent up to brokerages that are truly transacting real estate. Right. And then obviously regulatory oversight. Um, you know, these, these are common questions right now with all of the lawsuits and um, issues that we're seeing is thinking about that as an organization before thinking about locals who might want to protect their turf is a, is right. a pretty important starting point. Right. Okay. Um, part three is kind of the part I like the most because you talked about consumer access to listings and fragmentation, right? Like what were you, I think I know where you're kind of headed with this, but could you explain a little bit like what, what you wrote and what, what your concern was? So I think when you can start with the scariest and then talk about just people making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that might not be thinking about the big picture. So mm -hmm. you've covered a lot on the um, Newsday issues in, in Long Island. Yeah. Um, we can all admit there are bad practitioners in every industry. Yep. Um, and when they get highlighted, we need to look and say, is this commonplace? Is this rampant? So we have evidence that we've got issues with um, with fair housing, with steering. Um, and so the next question is, how how often does that happen? And maybe we can or we can't put a metric on that right mm -hmm. away. But we're looking at all of our processes and saying, first of all, we're supposed to be here to serve consumers. And so let's do the carrot approach, which is let's do this right, get trained up, put our processes in place so that we're not discriminating between not just consumer groups, but groups of professionals that probably serve those consumer groups. Mm -hmm. and that's really all, you know, the, the steering side. But then, of course, you know, the repercussion potentially happen if you were outside those lines. And we usually only think about that in the one agent with one client or many clients out in the space, opening doors, scheduling uh, showings, but we see technical processes showing up that could create those same sort of um, bottlenecks. So the idea that we're going to pull back the listing address from listings that we put into the MLS, and that's under the guise of creating privacy for the seller. Now, there may be an edge case where that might benefit a certain seller outside of the six ways that I've already listed right. that you can that privacy for that seller but what it definitely does is allow a listing broker to say that kind of agent and that kind of consumer now we, it doesn't have to be a protected class we're talking about here we're just saying they're making decisions as to who should know about this property for sale mm -hmm. um, and they're allowed to do that in a private listing sort of scenario but once you've joined the realtor association and the mls um, does it make sense to add more gates between buyers and their agents and sellers in a listing? Um, and, and do we look at that from a fair housing perspective every time we make a decision about that? Um, because we know this person who may not normally be seen as someone who would be 
in the jet setting class that uh, works with this private listing network that only lists for celebrities may also be the person who saved up their retirement funds to buy some amazing property for their family. Um, and there's been a, a longstanding practice of agents choosing which sector, that was a brutal which word. demographic? <laughs> which demographic maybe? Well, it, not necessarily. They, they might not even be saying that, though. They might just be saying, I think I'm actually only looking for rich folk. But what actually comes out of those decisions might be demographically um, inhibitive to some folks in, in society. And it's not, um, it may not be their intent, but we set up rules to provide broad access for the marketplace. And the more we put bottlenecks in place for people to make individual decisions about who should get access and who shouldn't, we set ourselves up for problems. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip over four because, you know, <laughs> I felt like it. Go to five where you talked about the framework for evaluating MLS policy, which is really kind of the heart of it. Um, and if I understand, well, you know what? Let me just ask, what was your, like, if you could distill that down to say two or three core ideas, what would you say those core ideas are? Um, well, you have to start with the decade of doing policy work and seeing this eternal battle between local businesses, local MLSs, um, rightfully wanting to make decisions that benefit the uniqueness of their marketplace, and then bristling at national mandates that mm -hmm. force them to do business in a certain way. And, and they're both important, and no one likes that answer. Um, you know, folks want national consistency if they're technology folks and their process folks, and everybody wants unique localness if they're running the local organization. So right. there's never really been a metric or at least a, a framework to say, let's talk about how that comes out on one side or the other when we make right. policy decisions. A lot of times we see a problem, we attack it with a policy, and then we ask the industry if this is a good idea or not. Um, so, you know, over the years, and, and I mentioned Katie Johnson, um, general counsel at NAR, who is a part of, of all these policy making uh, meetings, um, had asked this sort of like, let's take this back to ground zero and say, if we need something to be a national mandate, it's going to force an MLS to do work. It's going to force them to implement rules, to do compliance, um, agents to change their practices, brokers to change their practices. Is this something that's necessary because it's going to critically change our cooperation, our data integrity, or our transparency with consumers? And if so, let's look at national mandates. If not, that doesn't necessarily make it a bad idea, but let's give it a little bit more scrutiny before we pass something that the DOJ is going to want to take a look into. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really just uh, trying to be a little bit more objective at the start to also create sort of a documented process as to how we got to some of these things that, I, I mean, I firmly believe many of the national mandates are absolutely critical to um, being efficient and being transparent and having a long-term vision for the MLS space. Okay. Um, and you talked a lot about MLS and consistency. And this was like some of the best stuff, man. Like we talked about Sally Seller, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and right? All of that. So here... Here's my take on it. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a very bad and brief overview, but all I can say to anyone listening is you got to go read all five, you know, articles, right? Um, am I, so is it, let, let's just put it this way. I felt like after reading through all five, you're really pushing for more, more national policies. That's how it felt to me, right? Because for consistency purpose and, and all of that, right? Like when you talked about consumer experience with MLS and consistency or, or, you know, participant access to listings or what have you, a lot of it just comes down to we have 600 or so MLSs down from 850. Woohoo. Right. And sure. they all have like this patchwork of regulation, patchwork of rules, you know, and you're kind of like, this sucks, right? This sucks for the consumer, sucks for professionals, sucks for everybody. So it did feel a little bit like you're without coming out right and saying so, it felt like you were advocating for more of a national uniform, you know, policy you know, as much as possible. Is that a unfair characterization or is that just my impression or, or what do you think? I, I'm not surprised you came away with that impression. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I think th those are the calls we get from the marketplace in particular technology focused organizations. Right. Um, obviously consistency is important there. Um, and, and we have to look at ourselves as a, a more and more transparent and open industry. 
Um, we're not these silos of folks trading index cards with listings. Um, and so, you know, from a personal perspective, yes, I, I'm a technology advocate. I think we should get better and more information out. A consumer should have an understanding of what this process is going to look like as they go through a home buying or selling process. And they shouldn't see a website that says this property has 95 days on market over here, but it's five days on market over here and it's coming soon, but it can't be shown. Mm -hmm. And there's three different commission rates offered depending on which um, MLS my buyer's agent is working in. This right. is really not good for consumers. Um, so, you know, these are not reso opinions or positions, but at the same time, uh, anyone involved in our efforts is looking for efficiency in a streamlined technology space in real estate. Um, and if we can't go to a national aggregator and say this information is correct because we know we've got a common map to, you know, this kind of consistent information a consumer wants, um, then we're allowing others to create whatever map they want on top of that, which is probably not going to be as accurate as if you used the practitioners, the people creating the data in a consistent way. And I think that's the most important part for the agents and brokers to understand at, at the MLS level in particular, um, is that that's their value. Their value is they're the ones creating, sourcing this data. I, hmm. I, look, I, I see the look on your face. Yeah. One of their values. <laughs> Their primary value is the services to the consumer. But the, the point is there is value in the person who creates and sources that data. Can they go sell it on their own? Of course not. But if they can do it consistently across the industry and then consumers rely on those broker and agent and MLS driven data metrics for everything they do, see, because you're building value and it's transparent and, and it's not locked up in silos and strange statuses um, and different ways of counting some of the simplest things that consumers want to be able to read about on a, on a consumer facing website. Okay. So are you suggest, uh, so are you saying that I'm wrong for thinking you want more national uniformity or that I'm right for thinking you want more national you're, uniformity? You're, oh, you're fully correct as far okay. as my personal opinion. Yes. Okay. So I guess a question for you there is, and this is just something I've run into in the last 11 years of practice in this space, right? The thing that I can't get over, and so this is just a question for you, is in a lot of cases, this just comes down to money, right? That a lot of this, the problematic MLS, and let's be honest about this, right? We're not talking about, you know, we don't have a whole lot of problems like the top 50 MLSs, you know, that are really large, they're really well run, they're professional, they don't, you know, they don't really have a huge problem with sort of national standards or mandates, whatever you want to call it, right? We're talking about like the hundred person MLS in the middle of nowhere, right? Or we're, we're talking about some of the smaller guys. The smaller guys are the ones that where they're the cash cow for the realtor association that owns it, and without them, those associations feel like we don't, we don't exist, right? And I do feel like there's an aspect of which the different rule sets and the weirdness that exists, a lot of it is literally just to try and put up barriers against the big regional next door. And I feel like without solving the financial problem for the association, the owner, it's almost impossible to get them to say, hey, we should voluntarily join this national mandate and have our data look the same because then it makes it so much easier for the big regional next door to come in right, and just like, poach our people right it's like why are you part of that hundred people just join us you know like that sort of thing how do we overcome that is there a way of doing that without somehow guaranteeing or reassuring that local association you will still stay in business yeah, there's a lot of layers to that i question. know there is yeah <laughs> um i mean initially associations and mls is at least uh, you know, realtor owned MLS, they're supposed to have business models that can separate the association from the MLS and have either be sustaining, you know, the association should be able to live on its own. Correct. We do know that the MLS is a cash cow in a lot of cases. Um, so it's really about, you know, the association saying, um, you know, are we going to become part of a shareholder MLS? And is there a revenue model there? That's if we're just talking about the money, mm -hmm. is there a way for us to do that? Um, you know, there's more than just the money, though. There's also um, just personal pride, history, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the MLS or the association, a lot of these organizations view both of those as one and the same, which yep. ideologically is problematic, but it is what it is. 
They do. They have local government affairs groups who do really, really important information at the local level. Yep. And if you were to strip away that association, does that take away some of the credibility? That would be some of the questions that they would have. Um, we've had the idea of having chapters instead of associations yep. that are local, so they can do some of those things. Um, but it's inertia. Uh, you've just got the vast majority of people involved in these organizations are selling real estate all day, every day. And then they're come, they're asked to come back, change everything that they do, give away this huge business benefit that they provided in the MLS. Um, and even though that would provide more efficiency for everyone overall, it's not a surprise that um, you know folks like their local MLS and their local association and the way things are. It doesn't even have to be consolidation. Just changing over your MLS software is enough to bring in which is in the pitchfork. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I think it's partially financial. It's partially the, you know, the way you structure your governance and, and your, you know, your business model for your association. Um, and then it's, it's partially just the inertia of don't change what's working for me right now, um, which we talk about at Riso a lot of what's working in quotes is not necessarily the best path, but ends up being the decision made a lot of times. Mm. So uh, the thing that I keep thinking about reading through this five parter is, it feels to me like maybe the ultimate solution to, you know, sort of make everything more coherent is for NAR to take more of a, uh, more of an ecumenical approach. Okay, here's what I mean by that. <laughs> it's like, I, as, as the word left my mouth, I'm like, people have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. In other words, behave a little bit more like the Catholic church as opposed to a congregational church, you know, where... So the difference is like the Catholic Church, all the priests work for the Catholic Church, right? right? Whereas in a congregation, the minister works for that local congregation, right? Uh, if what we need as an industry, as you know, realtors, as whatever, maybe one of the solutions here is for NAR to say, you know what? Uh, we understand your financial concerns. The biggest line item is going to be staff. Maybe we just pay all of those salaries, right? And then some of the dues then just get routed up to, you know, up to NAR, if you will, or maybe a state association. I don't, I don't know. But I guess what I'm wondering is if we alleviated that financial pressure on the local association, maybe they would find it a little bit easier to deal with these MLS sort of issues. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, well, you're actually on a good track in a couple of ways there. Um, and I did get ecumenical, but that's just because I've spent a lot of time in Catholic school. I know, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's there's two ways actually that makes a lot of sense where you are not um, you know coming down from on high with an edict, but you are approached to make that happen. So there are MLSs, regional MLSs, who will go out and hire the staff of, right. of locals, as you said, and you can do that from the association level or the MLS level, right. and be able to service locally what you need to, not lose any jobs, um, and still have that sort of um, autonomy where needed. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then at the NIR level, um, we've actually been working on for some time having grants available for uh, associations with MLSs that think they should probably look into consolidation, but don't have the time or the resources to actually make that investigation. Um, and both of those are good ways um, to have carrots as well as stick approaches to, um, to getting people involved there. How much is there in terms of resources for that? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. How many organizations have no interest in that because autonomy um, and what some might call protectionism is actually the goal? Well, that would be interesting to find out too. Right. Um, there, there are different motivations out there. Right. All right. Yeah. I mean, it's just something that occurs to me. Like, and you're right. Some of it is just like, it doesn't even matter. That's not what it's about. It's that we want to keep the brokers from the big city out. I mean, we see this all the time in sort of resort markets, right? It's not <laughs> a secret. It's, it's not, not a secret. secret. Everyone knows. And it's like, well, that's not really a valid exercise of your market power. But, you know, that's... So the second it, question you, is... You don't even have to put really into that sentence. It is not yeah, a valid exercise it of is your market not. power. And, but to a certain extent, that becomes the government's problem, not NAR's problem. You know what I mean? Like, to some extent... But that leads to a second thing, which is, you know, I, I think you were one of the ones who told me once after like my Inman speech or something, you're like, you have this boogeyman that you'd love to bring up all the time, which is like the government. <laughs> I think it might have been you. <laughs> if not you, it was Joe Rand or one of those, one of, those, one of my other friends. Um, 
But when you look at the problem in this way, like what, I guess a way to think about it is, is NAR, is RISO, is, are these private organizations really the way to go about this? If what we really care about is consumer benefit at the end of the day, is that not the rightful place for the government, which is after all elected representatives? I mean, we theoretically live in a democracy. Like, should they not be much more involved in those types of things? Well, if you're just looking for rule setting and compliance, maybe the government is what you're you're looking for. But right. I think both of us would agree that um, running businesses is not necessarily the the government. Oh God, they're terrible at it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about in like these national mandates and policies. You know, things like dates on markets or you know the the Sally Seller situation you brought, bring up. It's like we're we're having a lot of infighting in the industry, and there's a part of me that thinks like you know as much as I hate the government. Let's face it. I'm a I'm a anarcho capitalist, so you know, like 110 percent libertarian. Even I look at that and kind of go, "Is this a place where we actually just need like daddy to step in and go? Listen, here's how it's going to be." Uh, I don't think almost anyone wants that. Um, I understand where you can see where that mechanism, where that lever would work. Right. Uh, I think that we've been given regular reminders that that can happen. Um, and while we don't want those um, when they happen, it's it's a good reminder that do this or else it will be done for you the in some of, cases. So yeah. I think we're getting another round of that, um, that it shouldn't just be us thinking about um, whether or not we agree yeah. with what, you know, the current mandates might look like, that that's there. And at a minimum, we can take the very obvious things that we do that look like we're either limiting information or services to consumers, mm -hmm. or we are limiting certain things based on who those consumers are and who they work with and say, do we want those reminders from the government again? Right. Do we want to have them to get involved again? Right. And the answer is always no. So we should have that as sort of a, um, a gate that all of our decisions go through. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Matt. That's... But God, you know, it's so hard to convey that that reality. <laughs> it, it has to make its way down through multiple levels of bureaucracy, um, trade organizations, brokerages, MLSs. There's um, there's a lot to filter that through. Yeah. All right, man. So let's take a let me take a step back because I've I've just been curious to talk to you about you know this big picture stuff. Um. So you, obviously, we talked about the commission lawsuits that are happening. I don't know what your thought is on whether, you know, who wins or loses that. I think I'm now on record as saying I think the plaintiffs will win at trial. Um, I think NAR and the corporate defendants might win on appeal. But at trial, it just feels to me like, you know, the judges uh, have kind of tipped their hand, you know. Uh, so I feel like they win at trial. Um, which then raises the question of if cooperation compensation goes away, right? The question I keep asking myself, you know, for the past few months is, what is the MLS without cooperation compensation? Right. So I think there's um, an assumption there that goes quickly from zero to sixty. It's, it's just, yeah. So first of all, I don't, I don't have an opinion on what. I mean, do do I think that the system that's in place works fine and is fair and is transparent to consumers? I think so, but we'll see what right. um, what the judges know, the decide. Yeah, exactly. Um, so cooperation and compensation, well, you know, simply displaying a, uh, a buyer's agent commission, the compensation offered to buyer's agents, um, you know, personally, I haven't seen it be any sort of an issue in the Seattle market in Northwest MLS where it's been displayed. Um, there's certainly folks who have ideas where they think that might affect, um, you know, compensation and business mm -hmm. processes later, uh, but it hasn't been, you know, particularly an issue. If there's a decision to change or restrict the way that commissions can be shared, um, yeah, that's a big deal. That's yeah. a very big deal. That, that's what Actually. I'm talking about, right? And we're talking about yeah. voluntary yeah. compliance. We're talking about the court saying you are not allowed to share commissions. But but I don't also assume that that means that compensation doesn't still exist within the MLS necessarily or that cooperation especially doesn't still exist within the MLS. So compensation part's tricky. You're right. Um, you know, is it a good idea for the buyer's agent to have to pay or the buyer to have to pay their own agent? I don't think it is. I think it's a problem for home ownership. We've had people talk about, um, you know, is there a way we could potentially finance that commission? 
sure, um, sure. to make that happen. I, that That's one potential avenue. It sounds like a very difficult regulatory agency laden path, but it's out there. Uh, I think it's a problem for, for buyers. We've created a system where the professionals can get paid for their services and the buyers are not hamstrung in how much cash they have to buy a home. And it's important you know, to say, because this boogeyman of buyer's agents not being worth their commission rate, uh, you know, we could talk about what we're not going to talk about. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's irre- it's well, almost irrelevant. Yeah. Buyers ask agents to work with them over and over and over, no matter how much information we give them, right. it's almost all out on the web. They've got every research system they can have. They've got every business model under the sun that will do all kinds of you know flat fees, minimal service. Um, whatever it is that they want, and they still keep going back to agents. So it's clear they want buyer's agents to work with them. What they're willing to pay is a totally different question Correct. based on the model. But let's assume that you can't share a commission in the MLS anymore. Brokers are still going to want to have set rules of the road where um, how I set up a, a showing and how I agree to a showing and how we agree to accept uh, an offer on a contract how we agree to close it, how we agree to save the data for comps and CMAs and appraisals. There's still that cooperative marketplace that would be there. But to your point, I, I can't um, I can't guess what that shift would be if the compensation part were, were changed drastically, but I don't think it takes away the, the cooperation angle in the MLS. The cooperation angle, does the cooperation angle matter if there's no compensation? It does. Um, because you can't just go Mad Max out in the marketplace uh, with with your buyers and do whatever you want if all of the brokerages still agree that we have rules as to who we share listings with, how we share listings with them, um, not just showings and offers and closings and recording of data, but um, compliance with those rules and a um, you know a compliance department that may issue fines or penalties for. Uh, the agent who shows up without setting an appointment or walks into an occupied home and the sellers are there because they didn't follow those cooperative rules. So there's still a lot of cooperative structure there. Change significantly if there weren't a compensation factor as well. I, I, yeah. So basically, the thing that I've been struggling with, Sam, is do does the does the MLS? I mean, and let's face it, the MLS's enforcement authority today with cooperation and compensation is still a little bit suspect. Like in some area, in some right, if there's no compensation, right? Because to me, it felt like this the reason why membership in the MLS is so valuable, right? So, I, as an agent or a broker, why I'm willing to pay the fines, why I'm willing to, you know, comply, why I'm willing to follow these rules is because membership in the MLS is so very valuable, right? Not just for some sort of, you know, uh, generalized cooperative, like, no, no, it means money in my pocket, like, I am guaranteed payment. If that piece goes away, then it makes me wonder like, okay, does the MLS then still have enough power, enough carrot, you know, to be able to say, you still need to comply with these cooperative rules, right? Like that's, that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah, I think cooperation and compensation are 1A and 1B. Right. Um, and whether or not there were commissions, brokers want the entire pool of listings to show to their clients. Now, as we've talked about, who knows what the commission structure looks like when you're trying to right. sell somebody else's listing. Right. But it doesn't take away the fact that in most countries, you've got, you know, 150 different brokerage silos of, um, you know, brokerage listings and the consumers hate it. Mm-hmm. The consumers, by and large, if they see what they could have in an aggregated marketplace, like an MLS marketplace, they absolutely hate what the other model is. So if you keep 1A and you've got the broker cooperative with shared listings. So we've all got a full inventory um, and you've got rules around showing, selling, closing, recording those um, those properties. Uh, that's still actually the primary value before we even talk about commission sharing of the MLS. Um, but yes, then, then does it become p- potentially more compensations out in the Wild West? I don't know. I'm not even right. going to guess right, right. what that's like. Well, I mean, I've guessed because uh, I think if 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 this comes to pass, then basically we just look like commercial real estate. I don't think so, but tell we, me why. We are moving up on on other things. No, so. tell me why. Why do you think it doesn't? Um, because you've got a million and a half 
professionals who have come to learn the benefits of sharing listings. That's what they've been trained in. They've sort of been baptized in that. So they're okay. They actually like cooperating with other brokers. Not all of them, obviously. Um, but that's what they see is the way they do business. Whereas, I mean, I've been with a brokerage for 20 years that has a commercial and a residential arm. Mm -hmm. And the commercial brokers view it as... Um, I mean, they'll, they'll say it out loud, give out less information, make the consumer call me directly. Right. We're not going to cooperate with another broker um, because that's the way we've been trained. That's the way we've always done business. I don't think you just flip the mindset of these residential agents, particularly those working with buyers who have access to all of these listings from all the other brokerages and have them say, let's just turn that off because they're not siloed into buyers, agents and listing agents. They got teams that service both and they make commissions from both sides of those transactions so um there's again it's inertia it's a whole lot of individual independent contractors who have learned this business over the decades um and they have benefited so much from having access to the entire aggregated listing database um it would be really hard to see them saying let's just turn that off um and go solo now could some brokerages do that if they had massive market power in one marketplace they could, but they could today too. Mm -hmm. um, if you have 50, 60 percent market power in a, in a, you know, some metro, you could walk away from the MLS today, mm -hmm. and they don't. So they are still seeing that benefit. So in that context, what do you make of fair display guidelines? Be more specific. So fair display guidelines, you know, Realty Alliance, they came up with it. It got embraced by a whole lot of brokers, including, by the way, I think your former employer, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, you were, you never worked for Coldwell Banker. Um, what's their fate? The, the big one up I, there. I've, I've been with Coldwell Banker Danforth. Coldwell Danforth, Banker Bain right. is also right, a, a large. Right. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure yep. Bain is like one of the biggest proponents of, of the fair display guidelines and broker public portal and all of that, right? Yep. But that's yeah. kind of the, the basis of, of fair display guidelines. It's not quite as saying we're not, we don't want to share listings. Basically, what it's saying is my listing, my lead, right? Yeah, so there's two parts to that. Yeah. Um, I think the, the initial part is should a listing agent be properly identified and, and very conspicuously anywhere a listing goes up? And I think that's a fair thing to ask for. Mm -hmm. um, Why? Wherever it goes up. Well, so for the consumer who wants choices, if they want to work with a buyer's agent, that's okay. If they want to call a listing agent and continue to work with a buyer's agent, that's okay. But they should know who represents them and who doesn't represent them. Mm -hmm. um, so, And we can talk about the nuances of that in IDX versus portals. Uh, but point being, um, there's a licensed, a state licensed person listing a property for a consumer into that should know what the situation is. So. Now, my listing, my lead is not exactly the same thing. Right. Um, right. That's getting into business processes is how do you deliver those leads out. But I think there's a lot of initiatives right now um, where they're looking into that and saying, IDX was developed 20 years ago and we can continue to improve on it um, or you know similar concepts to it. And do we need to do a better job of displaying the listing agent? Maybe we do. And this is in connection with the big thing you guys have put, the networked office feed, is that right? So that's that's one of many ways you might have this kind of thing happen. It could happen through current IDX policy if we wanted more prominent display. Um, so just quick background, the you know the RESO um, brokers, the broker members of RESO um, came to us with, that was one of their pain points was getting uh, just broad data access. All the data access we already get from the MLS and all the rules we have well, you know, today we work in three MLSs and we get three IDX feeds and three VAL feeds and three back office feeds with different rule sets. Right. And it's a mess. It's the same listing nine times with different rules. Let's just have one policy, one set of rules. Um, just open up the floodgates. We'll follow these rules better because we can actually read them and understand them in one set concept. Um, and there's been a, a push in that as well currently to say, do we need to also better identify and display who the listing broker is there as well? Mm, okay. Is the listing broker or listing agent? Uh, listing agent, but okay. both. Um, you have to have the listing broker advertised, but the listing agent is sort of that next extension, which it seems like most companies with the latitude to do that are, are starting to expose that. We see that on 
um, Redfin and Zillow. And um, I think we might have that on home snap. I'd have to check into that, but yeah. it seems like more companies are trying to put more of that listing agent information out now. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the reason why I asked that is just like a small little detail, but there's a lot more of the consumer justification with the listing agent as opposed to listing broker. Right. Because right. The, the, the thing that's really compelling to me, right. Uh, is I'm a consumer. I want to know about this house. Right. Like I'm, I'm on Zillow, I'm on Redfin, I see one to three Main Street. Oh, that looks like a really interesting house. I w- the person I want to talk to is the person who knows the most about that house. Right. So in, in this case, it would be the listing agent who listed the house and knows, oh, yeah, it smells like cat pee or, or whatever. Right. Or it has granite countertops, not, you know, like those. That's the detail that as a consumer, I'd want to know. And I think one of the complaints that people do have, the listing agents have to have is, on Zillow or on Redfin or whatever, they get sent to some agent who might be in the same MLS, but they've never walked that house. They, in fact, they're not even near the neighborhood. They don't know anything about that house, and that's their. I mean, the suggestion is that that's a that's a disservice to consumer. I'm like, okay, that seems. I'm pretty. That, I find that pretty compelling. That compelling is way less if it's the listing broker, right? Right, right, sure. I mean, the listing broker's never seen the house either, right. in most cases. Right, so, so if it's... It makes sense. Giving yeah. people the option, um, I don't think there's any issue with that. I think yeah. it's an important thing for them to be able to find, um, you know, to your point, there are different personalities there. Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, having been a selling agent for many years, I can tell you, uh, you saw the Super Bowl commercial with the Remax. No, it was a Saturday Night Live. The Remax agent and the Zillow. Yeah, yeah, night. yeah. Uh, but... There's there's a stereotype of some agents as being obnoxious and pushy yeah. in sales, um, and it's not everyone, but it is some. And there are plenty of consumers who do not want to talk to the salesperson who's trying to sell them the property, yep. and would be happy to go with their buyer's agent to go smell the cat pee themselves. So right. um, is, there's a difference, but does giving people that information and that opportunity create anything bad? I don't think it does. It's, it's yeah. just a positive. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes sense to me. All right. Um... Hey man, we're already like an hour in, you know. I know we could just go easy, easy hours and hours. To... So, what are you up to with Riso? I mean, let's wrap up. Like, what's what's what are you working on? That and again, Riso is one of these weird things, right? Like those of us who are kind of more into the MLS side of things, and more in the technical side of things, we understand Riso's importance and whatnot. But you know, the general general industry public i feel like really doesn't pay any attention to, to what you guys are up to and yet y'all are doing some really important work so you know what, what are you guys up to yeah it's a it's a pretty exciting time if you're into data standards and technology efficiency so i'll i promise i'll not get too uh technical for your yeah. audience but, yeah. um there's really actually some some big developments the last uh year and a half or so um so you know just getting the guts of what we do at reso we define a data dictionary that's just um, fields that should be common across MLSs. So if you've got a brokerage or an agent tool or an app and you see you know, a, an agent across the country who also has a new app that you'd like to adopt, you should be able to light that up in your MLS right away. It's a CRM, it's a broker back office tool. Um, it should be called ask price in Northwest MLS, sorry, list price, and it should be called list price in Miami's MLS, not mm-hmm. ask price, not anything else. So basic data dictionary things are just simple data structure types. So we just re um, ratified a data dictionary 1.7, which is a huge step forward in terms right. of data consistency. Um, we just ratified a new web API core standard that brings together some of the inconsistencies we had in the way we share data. Um, don't really need to get deeper than that. It's just a better modern way to share data. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you see these other policies coming in from other parts of the industry that are all kind of focused on the same effort is to make sure agents, brokers, and technology companies get um, efficient, clean, fast, robust data. And it's CMLS's participant data access policy that went through NAR. It's the MLS standards work groups um, policy that went through NAR that requires all of your fields that you're giving to brokers and RETs that's the old standard, need to be in Web API as well. Um, you've got this LEAP policy, which is, we called it now at Reso. It's making its way out of CMLS called LEAP. It's got some additional um, you know, changes and improvements to it. Yeah. That is supposed to get the brokers back all of their data from this multi-broker data set. This is the reason, one of the many reasons they joined the MLS uh, with one simple access policy. So 
we take all that, and then at Risa, we built a totally new testing platform. So all the MLSs right. who need to get certified, which are every realtor MLS needs to be in compliance with NAR's policy um, that they comply with Risa standards. But really, the private MLSs do this too, because they're a part of this moving the industry forward effort. Um, so with a much tighter self-serve testing platform, technology companies can develop systems and use resource testing tools as they're doing that. They can mm. see where they're going to, you know, have errors in the future and, and not make those mistakes. It's sort of a future proofing of um, technology they build. Um, and so you take that platform and then add reporting on top of it. So we don't just certify a company anymore and say, hey, they passed and they're gold. Uh, they mm. passed and they're silver, they failed. It's a full data report that's going to be on reso.org that will say they passed Web API Core 1.02. Here are all the functions this server can support. They passed Data Dictionary 1.7. Here's the metadata. Here's all the fields, all the enumerations. Here's their local custom fields that are not part of Data Dictionary mm -hmm. and may not be in your other markets. So you, then you take these big data, data aggregators and they can look at this and say, I already know how to map. Mm -hmm. I can map across MLS marketplaces before I get there, which is one of those things that used to live in the shadows. We didn't really know what the data was going to look like when they get there. Right. But if you're using the web API service, now you've got your path to data shares. If two MLSs want a data share, you can look at both of those reports after they get certified and say, we already know which 500 fields are going to match. Mm -hmm. We can data share on these 500 fields tomorrow if we want to set up our systems that way. So it's really about exposing, you know, cleaning things up, tightening the screws, exposing it for transparency to the world, and then having compliance rules, um, which are your NAR rules that we're sort of back to on a national right, mandate right. of, of <laughs> complying and follow up from RESO and NAR when there's not compliance there. Um, and it's usually just a misunderstanding uh, when we have issues with compliance there. So two things that do come up from MLS executives, and MLS boards, at least that I run into, and it might be a mm -hmm. much smaller subset. I get that. Uh, but how far away are we from true front end of choice uh, for the MLS, as well as how far away are we from true portability of MLS platforms, meaning switching from Flex to Matrix or, you know, switching from Matrix to Black Knight or, or whatever, right? I mean, today that is just... I mean, it's it, you know, I mean, it's it's one of those incredibly difficult major initiatives, you know, with what you guys are up to is is there some date in the future where like that just becomes an easy plug and play kind of thing? Uh, it's a good question. I was just on with our exec committee talking about that this morning. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a couple different layers to that. The simplest version is, is every MLS going to change its core database to be native data dictionary? Um, that's not an easy thing. It's not an inexpensive right. thing, um, but that's one way you get there. Now, the status quo right now is the vast majority, almost every MLS has non-standard core database, and they put a layer on top of that, which is Reso Web API, right. where they transform that data into standardized, and then right. they send it out to partners who use right. that. So um, you can get that standardized data from any system but you can't necessarily push it back into that system, which is what you need for you know, this front end of choice. We need to right. be able to update in different systems. So um, that, that standard for um, pushing data back, the web API update um, is, is one way to get there. And we have you know, basically the most of the spec for people to be able to do that. We need more organizations to implement, but they still, most of them have this layer in between outside data partners and their actual core database mm -hmm. where they're doing this you know, transformation to a non-standard system. That will always make it difficult um, until the MLSs can, can do something. And you know, we say native data dictionary, there's a lot of different ways to implement that. But point being, they have an interface at the core MLS level that delivers standardized data. Right. Um, and either you do that and you send all of your data out from that core MLS interface, or you use the web API right. on top of a non-standard system. And there are ways to say, you know, if we wanted to do data shares across the industry, maybe we just define what we all agree is common and we can send across these web APIs back and forth. And then you have to deal on your back end with how you translate that into your system. But we all agree that this is the data share 
um, set of data that we should all be able to send across. It won't make everybody happy. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, Miami might think equestrian is a really important field and Hawaii might think sure. miles to vault sure. is important. Sure. We're not going to be able to do that right up front. But, you know, the capabilities there, the standards capability, um, I don't want to say it's straightforward, but it's nowhere near the difficulty of getting folks to say, we agree we're going to do the technical work to either totally tune our internal system to the dictionary or accept updates of dictionary standardized data and then have a way on our back end to get that back into our database and update it. Is there any vendor today that is native RISO dictionary and the core database? There are MLSs who have done it. Yeah, I mean, you've got you've got some MLSs who, you know, we always talk about the big ones like CRMLS. They've got three different um, front ends. So mm -hmm. they've got Blacklight Paragon, Flex right. MLS, and CoreLogic Matrix, and right. they've got their database separated from that. So they can right. do what they want with the data on the back end. Um, so there are a number of MLSs who have done it that way. Some of them may only have one front end for now, but they've gone back in and tuned their actual database to be standards compliant. I think we, um, Austin was one of the first ones that we talked about doing that. Sorry for those folks, so I'm not naming you all right now on mm -hmm. the spot. But, um, Wait, so the MLSs have developed these backend databases? But on the vendor side, they have not. So it, it, there's a mix. As your uh, attorney style would say, it depends. Um, right. there's, there are some that have a totally separate database, like a California regional MLS. Um, there are some that have worked with, say, CoreLogic and Matrix um, to, to tune that system. But it's you know, likely still a CoreLogic server and mm -hmm. system there. Um, and again, apologies to the other vendors. You're, you're all working on this to some extent or another, but just as examples, um, for the concept, you can totally split it off. Right. Well, you can just use your vendor system, but they can be tuned to data dictionary. Um, it's still by far the exception out there. Right. It is okay. probably, I would guess, less than 10 MLXs that have done it that. It seems to me that CRMLS and these MLS that have built this data back end, you know, they, they might have a product in the marketplace. They, they should think about packaging that stuff up and getting it out there. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> uh, we, we do see them providing services to other organizations. Correct, so. but it's always services, not here's the database. <laughs> you know? right. Pay That's us for true. the product. You know, they, they could just become a platform vendor to some extent. All right, uh, hey man, this has already been an hour. Um, really appreciate your time. You know, yeah, it wasn't, I was, I was halfway expecting a little bit more fireworks and contentious argument but. i was sort of expecting the same but i think you went easy on me today nah so. man you know because like well it, it, here's the funny thing i feel like we argue more in, in in print we do um and i think i get from people that um they think we don't like each other which, which is bizarre uh, <laughs> we agree on more than we disagree on yeah but it's fun to write about it when we disagree um those arguments are, are more interesting i think so not only that but maybe it's because i'm from new york you know, maybe it's because I grew up like Asia. I, I don't know what it is, but I've always felt like arguing is like how you make friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up in passive aggressive Seattle. So maybe I'm ah. just trying to spread my legs out. Maybe that's that. what it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, man, thank you very much. Uh, this was awesome. And uh, hopefully this new technology I'm using uh, is going to capture all of this. And we'll see what people have to say about this. All right. uh, it's always uh, always a pleasure to talk. I uh, yep. do get a chance to read. I did get to see Red's uh, the uh, Red Dot report from Coastar uh, yes. that Rob wrote. Very fascinating. Get a chance to uh, look into that as Thank well you. as Risa's working with Real Estate Data Course that's coming out this coming quarter. So awesome. We've got all the education out there for you if you need it. Awesome. And we might have to come back and do another session just on the Red Dot and then have you just tell me like all the ways that I'm wrong. That might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, man.